Where did you like to play as a child? I ask this question a lot because childhood memories shape us into the people we become. Welcome to Play It Forward, a worthy podcast. I'm your host, Lucas Ritson. Thanks so much for joining me. I talk a lot about play. I'm a dad, I'm a husband, I'm an educator, and I'm a playground designer. So I want to gather some of my favorite people who are advocates of children and nature and create a space to have an honest conversation about getting more kids outside. The power of play is very often underestimated and I think we all need a little more play in our lives. Our next guest wants you to create a homegrown national park and it's not as daunting as it sounds. Our philosophy at Worthy is creating environments for children to thrive. So who better to have on the show than someone that researches thriving environments as a profession? My next guest is a professor at the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware. He has authored around 100 research papers and has taught insect-related courses for 40 years. His book, Nature's Best Hope, was a New York Times bestseller. And so a big warm welcome. Welcome to the studio all the way from Delaware, 6 p.m. at night, dedicated to the cause, Doug Tallamy. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, thanks for the invitation. Pleasure to be here. I'm so excited to chat to you and break down how the roles and just bringing the awareness to ecology for our listeners, um, be it if they're educators trying to convey the importance of environment to children. And also, I love the fact that you're promoting people to just take action on this topic that seems so daunting for so many and you get can get less lost in this politicalization of ecosystems and environment so i love the fact that it's like hey you do you you bring it home literally how did you <laughs> land on that as an action point well you know we have a, a global biodiversity crisis which gets worse every day but it's a global crisis with a grassroots solution it's going to take good earth stewardship by everybody. But, you know, that makes sense. Everybody on the planet requires a healthy ecosystem. So why wouldn't everybody be, have the responsibility of good earth stewardship? You know, right now we have, we have a few uh, specialists, few ecologists, few conservation biologists, and they're supposed to take care of the earth. Everybody else has a green light to destroy it. That makes no sense. Yeah. So, so yeah. This the is ratio a is a touch out on that one. Um, <laughs> That's big. Because we're framing up as a bit of an introduction to ecology, can you give that definition to our listeners? That like, okay, what are these guys on about? What is ecology? Yeah. Ecology is a relationship between, um, it's the study of, of how uh, plants and animals interact with their physical environment. Anything with an ology on the end is the study of. Yeah. And entomology? Same thing, the study of insects. Yeah. Excellent. And um, when you say, uh, what was the other phrase just then thrown in? Um, biodiversity. Some people not, might not know what that biodiversity is as well. Uh, it's all of the life forms on the planet. Now you can divide that in many different ways. Typically we're talking about species, the number of species that are out there, but you can talk about genetic diversity. You can talk about ecosystem diversity but it's the diversity of life forms. And again, typically we measure that in terms of the number of species that are there. And um, this is an example of how keen I am to get into this topic. I haven't even asked you the question that we ask all guests and how we start. Where did you like to play as a child? It's a oh. question we start with, but I was just so keen to get going um, on this topic. Yeah. We skipped over it. Yeah, somebody asked me that the, this morning too. How did I get interested in this? I was born interested in, in other living things. Uh, I tell the story of moving into a, a new house in third grade and uh, there was a little pond next door. I used to go visit that every day, see what was happening in the pond. Uh, and you know, there were, there were toads there breeding and, and all the little pollywogs swimming around. And I was there the day those pollywogs started to, to, they matured and they were hatching, they were hopping out onto the, the land. But that was the day the bulldozer came and buried the, the whole pond. I don't think he even saw me sitting there. So he didn't bury me, but um, you know, right then that made an impression on me there. <laughs> we need to work on our relationship with the living yeah. things on planet earth. And, but I was always attracted to nature right from the start. And 
You touched on it there. Do you think children are born natural environmentalist, if you will, with this innate response to care for the thing that we're a part of and it's just bred out of us or what's happened? Um, you know, I have a brother and a sister. They were in the exact same environment as me and they're, they're just not into this. They, I, I'll say they don't really care. It's not that they don't care, but it's not, you know, it's not a passionate uh, uh, response to the environment the way I have. So I, yeah, I would say you are kind of born that way. It's not that they lost it. They never had it. <laughs> so, and I think that's pretty typical. Most, most people, I mean, E.O. Wilson talks about biophilia, how we, we all naturally like nature and on some level we do, but boy, we spend an awful lot of time destroying it for, for a, a species that loves it. So I'm not sure I buy into that. Yeah. And how have we, how have we got here? Cause we, we, lived within synergistically within environment for at some point and we were a part of it and now we consider as nature as the thing over there and us so what happened to create that divide well we are products of nature we've always depended on it but it also was our enemy uh, you know, the predators were out there hunting us, the drought was killing our crops, and, and uh, we would drown in floods. Uh, and the people that, that controlled nature were the ones that survived. So that has been part of our, our background. And we're, of course, very good at controlling nature. We're controlling it to the point where we've eliminated it. Uh, but it has led to this idea that humans are here in nature someplace else. Yeah. Um, which, you know, if there's just a few humans on the planet, That'll work, <laughs> but with 6.9 billion people, 7.9 billion people, I guess, it doesn't work at all. There is no someplace else for nature. And what we are not appreciating is the extent to which we need functioning ecosystems, not just in parks and preserves, but everywhere, mm -hmm. everywhere. Uh, and, and so that's why we're in the sixth great extinction because uh, we don't have uh, functioning ecosystems everywhere. We've, we've, and you know, we push them out to the corners of the planet and it's not enough. Yeah. And you mentioned there the sixth extinction. Um, it really frames up how urgent this situation is. So do you want to break that down? What's a sixth extinction? Well, Earth has experienced five mass extinctions prior to this. Uh, when asteroids hit and we have massive volcanic action and they still debate what causes these things, but they, uh, you know, right from the start, we've had these giant extinction events where it eliminates 80 to 90 percent of the life on the planet. And the last big one was when the asteroid hit 66 million years ago. But now we're, we're doing the same thing. And this is the first extinction event caused by a living, living being, a species. And that's that's us. Why is that a problem? People say, well, extinction is normal. Yeah, it is, but not at the rate at which we're causing it. When we had those mass extinctions, it took millions of years to rebuild the diversity that created a, uh, a healthy functioning planet. And by functioning, I'm talking about creating the life support systems that we humans demand, that everything demands, not just, not just us. We call them ecosystem services. Mm -hmm. And we know from lots of research that the more species in an ecosystem, the more stable it is and the more productive it is. So with, with you know, 7.8 billion people on the planet, we need more ecosystem services now than ever before. But we're, we're taking species out of ecosystems. We're, yep. we're uh, degrading them. So we're actually getting in fewer and fewer all the time. And that's just from a selfish perspective, that's why extinction is just not such a good idea. And it doesn't have to be global extinction. Local extinction still, you know, it, it ruins the ecosystem that you are depending on locally. So um, we need vibrant ecosystems everywhere. And then it actually impacts our lives as well. Although we can like manhandle it, for example, near me, there's beautiful bushland, kangaroos, sunrise and sunset driving down the road. I'd always look for the roos there. Um, bulldozers come in, bulldoze the whole thing down. Um, and then the people that live there, that it just created, destroyed all the biodiversity, that ecosystem that was there, they've just clear cut this whole environment. So I just imagine when the house go in and the lawn goes in, it's just going to be these barren wastelands of environment, which are actually just going to impact our health. Like the temperature 
just a slight change in temperature um, is going to impact the bodies and then impact health due to those temperature changes. Um, the, the lack of um, the microbiome of that diversity of what those, those beneficial interactions with nature, okay, avoid those. And then we wonder why we get sick and tired and frustrated and anxious. It's just perplexing to me. And the it reason must. you can live in an environment like that, at least temporarily, is because we're bringing in resources from places where we haven't wrecked the ecosystem. Yeah. But when we do that everywhere, you know, we're talking about colonizing Mars. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> Take everything. We I'd can't like look after this one. The, the, yeah, the, the Earth. We know this one works, but boy. Yeah. A frightening statistic um, in your book was that 54% of the um, America and you consider America having this great expanse of nature. 54% is what is it called an urban matrix was classified yeah, the, as within an urban matrix. Urban matrix. Right? That's it. Uh, suburban urban matrix. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can drive down the road and there are little patches of woods here and there, but they are far too small to sustain the species that actually uh, run, run an ecosystem. Yeah. You can appreciate that when you, when you get up in a plane and you fly. Um, then you get to see how chopped up the environment really is. Yeah. So we've got we've got what forty eight percent of the country is in agriculture, and the other fifty four percent is in this suburban urban matrix, uh, and then you got five percent that's relatively pristine. That's, that's not enough. <laughs> no. Not, and no. those are typically the mountaintops and places that are you know they're too rigorous for for the only reason we left them is because we can't live there. Yeah. Um, the other positive thing which I like about America's practice is you've got public land for national parks, which right. is great. Can you break that down, what that means? We do have these, these national parks and preserves and monuments. Um, and, you know, this was largely Teddy Roosevelt's idea 100 years ago. We want to preserve these places uh, because they're magnificent and we want future generations to be able to appreciate them. Uh, and, and, and they are magnificent and, and it's been great, uh, but there's two, two problems. And one is it suggests that nature is there just for entertainment. We want to go mm. see them and be entertained. It is entertaining, uh, but we need nature so that we have future generations, not just so that we can be entertained. Yeah. Uh, and it's very obvious that these parks and preserves are not working as intended because we are in the sixth great extinction. Yeah. We're losing species. You know, in, in North America, we've lost three billion birds in the last 50 years. That's a third of our breeding bird population. Um, if, if our parks and preserves were enough to sustain the species that we need to run our ecosystems, that wouldn't be happening. So these are great places, but we now need to practice conservation outside of parks and preserves. And that's, that's where this homegrown national park idea comes in. Uh, it's got to happen in your yard. It's got to happen yeah. in, in your corporate landscape. It's got to happen in agriculture. And that's, I, I love what you kind of just mentioned in passing then, but it was a really bit of an aha moment for me is that nature's being used for entertainment. Not, yeah. not seen as a place for, and I'm guilty of it. I'm thinking about, oh, yeah, I've just gone and done all this entertainment recently going up to the Daintree rainforest. Um, and, yeah, that's a big mind shift. It's like why are we considering it entertainment when it's integral for our overall well-being and existence? <laughs> it, it, there's nothing wrong with being entertained by nature and, and appreciating it. Yeah. But if you think that's all it's there for, that makes it not essential. And if it's not essential when, when resources are in short supply and push comes to shove, then nature takes a back seat. And that of course is what happens all the time. Resources are always in short supply. Yeah. And you know, the budget, the, the national budget to run the national park system is, is in under a line item called non-essential items. Wow. So if we run out of money, we just, it doesn't matter. Nature is essential. It's not optional, you know, and that's, yeah. that's the missing link here. Yeah, absolutely. And so we've spoken about this, the urgency around it from a really big scale of like impact on a whole country and, and from a world standpoint, how do you, how do you get that to your backyard or your playground? And your front yard. Don't forget. Yeah. Your front. No. 
Well, uh, there are four things that every landscape has to accomplish. It's got to support a viable food web so that there are other, other species around because that's what's running our ecosystems. Yeah. It's got to support pollinators because, you know, they're, they're pollinating 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. So people say, well, you need them for agriculture. You need them to pollinate, you know, all those plants or, or we lose them. It's got to sequester carbon these days. We've got to pull carbon mm -hmm. out of the atmosphere and, and pump it into the ground uh, and, and build plant tissues out of it. That's, that's what plants are doing. And every landscape has to... Uh, be landscaped in a way that manages the watershed in which it, it lies. Yep. That has to happen everywhere. Uh, and if you, if you look at your yard and saying, am I supporting pollinators? Am I supporting a food web? Am I managing the watershed properly? And if you have acres of lawn, you are not. Yeah. Um, and am I, am I using the plants that sequester carbon the best? And again, lawn's the worst choice in, in that regard. Uh, so um, that's what brings it home to uh, the, the, the personal uh, landowner, because if you're going to, you know, if you're going to have the audacity say, I own part of the earth, there's a responsibility that comes with that. Yeah. You have to be a good steward of that piece of the earth. Don't worry about the whole, whole planet, just your piece. And that, that requires a lot of things. It requires shrinking the lawn, getting rid of your invasive species, putting in that pollinator garden, using keystone plants, lots of very important yeah. things. There's so much. So much, uh, so many avenues I want to go down right now. Um, let's start with this one. Um, You've mentioned food web. Um, traditionally in schools, we're talking about like the food chain. It's all about the food chain. But I, I love the fact that getting to know ecology in your work specifically and the reference of a food web opposed to a food chain, just that perception that things are like non-linear, things go out, well, things go sideways as long as well as up and down. Can you break down what's the main difference between a food web and a food chain? Well, if food any. chain is, is <laughs> linear and it's very simplified where you have yeah. a plant, one thing eats it, then one thing eats that and one thing eats that, that would be a linear chain. That's not the way uh, uh, life is. So for example, um, in my yard, I have, uh, I have oak trees. Yeah. Well, I also have uh, 511 species of caterpillars that eat those oak trees in my yard. So that's, that's one, one tree, one genus that has 511 lines coming out of it. And then all the predators and parasitoids of each one of those caterpillars. And that's why it builds this spider web type of interactions. It's just a more accurate way of describing it. But it's, yeah, it's the same principle as a food bread. It's just that it's, it's more accurate what's really happening. So when you take out that oak from your yard, you've destroyed an entire web of life, not just one thing that's going to eat it. Yeah. And that's what you're talking about, a keystone species? That uh, keystone species, you know, we're, um, people have, have compared native plants to non-native plants for a long time now. And on average, uh, native plants certainly support more life than, than non-natives. Uh, but we've, we've discovered that um, just 5% of our native plants are, are supporting 75% uh, of the, the energy that, that uh, supports those food webs. 14% of our native plants are supporting 90% of the energy that supports that food web, which means 85% of the native plant species that are out there are contributing, but not all that much. Yeah. So I, I talk about keys, I call them keystone plants. Remember the, the Roman arch, the keystone is yep. the stone at the top of the arch. And if you take that stone out, the arch falls down. Yep. So if you take these really important hyperproductive species out of the food web, the food web collapses. Mm. Even if you have dozens of other species, they're not those, those uh, really productive ones. So I, I, I talk to people and say, you know, you're building a, an ecological house in your yard. The keystone plants are the two by fours of the house. They're holding it up. They're not the only thing your house is built out of, but they're essential or your house is going to fall down. You don't build a house out of, out of wallpaper. Yep. Uh, so that's, that's the role of keystone plants. There's something that's got to be there and then you can diversify around there. Yeah. Something I think comes to mind is uh, like we've got keystone behaviors. <laughs> In, like certain people you're saying about only such a small percentage contribute 80%. You've got like yeah. such a small percentage of people being having keystone behaviors that are so integral to their environments and communities and habits and going out and do the uh, community gardens and all of that stuff. That's, a, that's awesome, awesome. So 
where, where do people start? Like we talk about ecology and keystone and species, like what's, what's the first step for people? Just imagine they've got a, they're trying to teach a child about environment and ecology because our default is to say, hey, we're going to go compost. Hey, we're going to go recycle. I'll teach you about environment. You've got to recycle. Yeah. When that, that's gripe. But how should people ignite this passion for children to understand environment? Children seem to inherently like animals, mm. but um, you can you can start by explaining well, what do those animals eat? Uh, and they can they can say well they eat food. Where does the food come from? And what builds the food? And, and you're going to get back to plants. Yeah. And most kids don't inherently like plants very much, but um, you know they are that first trophic level that's essential because they're the only things capturing energy from the sun and turning it into food. So all the animals that the kids like depend on plants at one, one level or another. Either they eat the plant directly or they eat something that ate the plant or they eat something that ate the something that ate the plant. But it all started with the plant. And if you, so the, the real learning moment here for the kids is that not all plants pass on their energy equally. Hmm. So if the plant captures the energy but doesn't let anybody else use it, what good is it? It's not yep. gonna help us. So you got it, this is where plant choice comes in. You know, you, <laughs> you Australians have given us eucalyptus. Boy, do we use that all around the planet. It's great in Australia, but it's terrible every place else because yeah. it doesn't support the life that it does in Australia. Yep. Yeah, it was remarkable to go, um, where was I? San Diego. And even yeah. <laughs> um, San Diego, I was like, what are all these gum trees doing? <laughs> yeah, they just seem so out of place. You're on the like anything there. That's what they're yeah. <laughs> just standing there. You're near the Baja Peninsula and you've got a gum tree. You're like, what's is it? Yeah. Um, and that brings us to another point. Like people might not understand the importance of native species versus non-native species. So can you break that down? Because we we at Worthy, we really, really prioritize natives. We pride ourselves on building play environments with completely native species. And um, Dan, our landscape architect, and Nikki, his assistant, they come up with plant tiles to create diversity and ecology within like a metre by metre square. And then they can roll those out across environments. And they've got different tiles for different environments, which is super exciting. But why is that important from an ecology standpoint to have natives? Because natives are uh, willing to pass on their, their energy. And mm. by willing, I mean, um, most vertebrates don't eat plants directly. They eat an invertebrate that ate the plant. So we're okay. talking about really the interaction between the plant and the insects that are eating that plant. The insects gather the energy from the plant and then other things eat those insects. Uh, well, plants don't want to be eaten. So they, they protect their tissues uh, in a number of ways, but typically with nasty tasting chemicals. Yeah. So the only insects that can eat a particular plant are the ones that have adapted to those particular nasty chemicals. And in order yeah. to do that, they specialize. They get really good at getting around particular groups of chemicals. And, but that locks them in to eating the plants that make those chemicals. And when yeah. you're locked into eating this plant, you can't eat this one over here. That's called host plant specialization. But that period of adaptation happens when the plant and the insect are interacting with each other over long periods of time. Mm. Uh, so that's why the native plants are supporting the native insects far better than the non-native plants where our native insects have never seen them before and they haven't had that period of adaptation. And if you think adaptation happens in a few years, it doesn't, you know, it's, it's thousands of years if then and what happens in the meantime? So we have we have the monarch butterfly over here. Everybody wants to save the monarch butterfly. Well, it's a specialist on milkweed. If you take milkweed away, it doesn't start to adapt to crepe myrtle. It dies, mm. yeah. <laughs> you know, and then yeah. it's gone and that's that. Yeah. Um, so that's why native plants are so important. They're the plants that have supported these co-evolutionary interactions over long periods of, of time. Yeah. Do you think we've forgotten what normal is? Like normal as a child was walking through the grass or walking just through your lawn and having, oh, I, I, yes. having grasshoppers jump and hit your legs and being outside and catching heaps of grasshoppers from everywhere. Now I go yeah. to do it with my children and it's like, where are the nothing. Grasshoppers? Yeah. Where are they? That's a yeah. prime example of what we're talking about. We, uh, my, my, my stepson got married, well, it's been a while now, 
in Tennessee. We went to the wedding in Tennessee. And the day before the wedding, we went out and took a hike in a natural area. And one of the people in the wedding party there is from Tennessee. The entire understory was Amur honeysuckle, bush honeysuckle from, from China. And it was yeah. in bloom. And she's walking around. And she said, isn't it beautiful? And I said, well, yeah, but these are non-native plants and they're not supporting anything. And she said, what do you mean non-native? They've been here the whole time I've been alive on planet Earth. I said, yeah, they have been. <laughs> but, you know, that's all. that was only 25 years and that's not very long. And um, so to her, that was normal, but it wasn't normal. It wasn't even close yeah. to normal. It had never experienced normal. It's, it's, it's frightening to think. Um, and another statistic, and I'm probably wrong, um, my retention on data, 90, 95% of vegetation in America is present with non-native species? Um, no, uh, we measured the plants that are used in suburban habitats. Oh, suburban, three, okay, yeah. Three states, and it yep. was, first of all, it was 92% lawn which is a non-native plant, yeah. but it was 80% 80, 80 non-native uh, ornamental plants that were used in these habitats. We've and got 3,300 species of introduced plants that are considered invasive. An invasive plant is one that's displacing native plant communities. 3,300 species, you know, that's, that's a lot of species. Yeah, and then that has a trickle-on effect that people always need to remind themselves of that yeah, it's not supporting a host plant of an insect. You not, might not care about the insect, but you're going to start caring when it's in, impacting your food supply. Well, you know, a lot of people do care about birds. They're yeah. The charismatic megaphone of these days. So, so think of the insects as bird food. Yeah. It takes, it takes thousands of caterpillars, 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to make one clutch of chickadees, which is a little bird, a third of an ounce. 6,000 wow. and 9,000 caterpillars just to get them to the point where they leave the nest. Um, so That's if you load the environment with non-native plants that aren't making any caterpillars, you've devastated the ability of that chickadee, that single pair to reproduce. It's one of the major reasons we've had the loss of 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. Yeah. It's, it's frightening. So where do we, where do we go from this point? Like, We've got, we're coming up against this machine in modern times about climate change and it being politicized. And it's like kind of a policy that's adapted by certain um, political parties. So you, you know, you're out. How do we get around that to get people connected and see it as it's their own choice? You know, I've been talking about this for, um, well, close to 15 years now. And fortunately, this particular environmental issue has not been politicized. So people from both sides of the aisle are upset yeah. that we're losing our birds. They're upset that we're losing our insects, which surprised me. Yeah. I didn't think they'd care. Uh, and, and, you know, what, what I'm saying is you can do something about this. And that makes them happy. They want, they want a solution here. When I say you fix the, the piece of, of land that you own, or if you don't own land, help somebody who does, help a park or a preserve. Then you're contributing yeah. to the solution and, and they get into that. They like that. It's, so there's nothing, you know, everybody in the planet requires a healthy environment, regardless of your political party. You, yeah. you really have to stretch. Of course, you could say the same thing for climate change, but <laughs> yeah. yeah. But this is an issue that is going on regardless of climate change, which is why I don't, you know, climate change is very serious. A lot of people talking about it. I try to stay away from it a little bit because this is a problem independent of climate change. Yeah due to our impact and our own habits over time. Not right. so much that bigger scale. Um, over the last 40 years of studying this topic, um, what's the standard observations you've made about like community perception um, and uptake in that time? Well, I actually haven't been, been working on this for, I, I started around year 2000, yeah. So let's say, let's call it, let's call it 20 years. Um, I have been uh, pleasantly surprised at the response. I thought the horticultural trade was was going to clobber me, and um, you know, I, I I wrote bringing nature home, but I didn't think anybody would read it. Mm. But 
but they did, and they're you know they're they're interested in in solving these these issues. So so the change has happened a lot faster than I thought it would. Um, we are talking about changing culture. We're talking about changing our relationship with the natural world from an adversarial one to a, a collaborative one. And changing culture is hard. It doesn't happen mm. overnight, but it is happening. And uh, I've been very, very pleased with the rate at which it's happening. So do you think we can regain that status of identifying as environment opposed to it being over there and us being us? I think we better. <laughs> we do better. We, you know, we achievable. have one planet. And if we humans take over uh, the entire planet and, and expect the natural world that supports us to be someplace else, that's not going to work. The logic is so obvious. That yeah. I really do. I, it's hard for me to believe that, that we're not going to catch on here. Yeah. Of course, the real, you know, the real challenge that nobody talks about is the number of people. We cannot continue to increase our population forever and expect any of this to work. The planet is not growing. So we can yeah. increase our population at the same rate the planet's growing, which is not very fast. Yeah, there's talk about the population plateauing at um, 10 billion. Is there any reason in your understanding is that's realistic or not? I don't think it is. We are already three times over the carrying capacity for, for humans. Uh, so mm -hmm. now you're, you're talking about adding another 3 billion on top of that and expecting everything to be fine. We've got this extinction crisis because we're taking all the resources that support the life forms that support us. Yeah. So saying, well, you know, with no other outside effects, we'll stabilize at 10 billion. There are outside effects. We call it war, disease, famine, all the things that yeah. are, that are um, uh, at least passively associated with environmental degradation. Yeah. Uh, and that's just going to get worse at an, at an alarming rate yeah. as we add more and more people to the planet. We're not adding. See, the more people that are there, the more we degrade the carrying capacity, the ability yeah. of the earth to support us. So, yeah, so, yeah it's a downward yeah, it's, spiral. It's kind of like um, we talk about invasive species, and it's kind of like we've taken the role of invasive species. We are the biggest invasive species, that's for sure. <laughs> oh, it's a sad state of affairs. Um, how do you stay optimistic? You start talking about extinction crisis and um, percentages of nature not present. These are hard things to talk about. So how do you stay optimistic? You know, I, I get emails every day from people who are doing what I'm suggesting, working on their property. They send mm. me pictures. Um, I've seen it at... at, at on my own property. You know, I, we moved into a, a piece of a farm that had been mowed for hay. There was, you know, just about nothing here. Four years ago, I decided to take a picture of every species of moth that has now making a living on our property because yeah. we put the plants back. And I'm up to 1,123 species of, of just moths, haven't gotten to the butterflies yet. Yeah. So this all tells me it works. You know, we're not, we're not making it up here. You really can. Put, yeah. put life back. When the World Wildlife Fund says we've lost two thirds of our, our wildlife, I say not at my house. Yeah. So if I can say that, so can you, so can everybody else. And that's what, what makes me optimistic. Yeah, I'm um, excited because um, we've recently acquired a block of land in a rural area, um, 5,000 square meters with a creek. It's half of it's grass at the moment. So um, I'm really excited about working, creating that ecosystem. There's platypus in the creek. Um, really? So, yeah. So it's going to, yeah, crazy. I'm super excited about creating that and bringing it up into the property and even creating more diversity because I go around and explore that creek and it seems pretty, um, there is a lot of native species because there's an environmental protection covenant. So invasive species, you have to remove them. Um, which is great, but there's still not much there. So I'd like to improve on that. Um, yeah. An interesting, uh, yeah, absolutely. It's going to be a um, life's work, I think. Um, and I have something to aspire to. I've got to hit the thousand moths mark. <laughs> <laughs> um, an integral part of how this food web works is these relationships. And it paint, once again paints a picture for us to understand a very complex idea is that um, we have producers and consumers 
within that web. And it doesn't mean you have to be one or the other because at some stage you, you, you're both as my understand, my very novice understanding is we can, we are both at some stage some, of our some life. Species, some yeah. species are, are both. Yeah. Yeah. So how do we, I think my observation is humans have become a pro, primary, <laughs> a primary consumer role in this web. So how do we get to that producer role? Yeah, we certainly have. Uh, we eat very high on, on the food chain, on the, on the, yeah. the food. Um, we, we love our meat. The number of cattle on the planet is a major environmental issue in terms of producing greenhouse gases, yeah. in terms of the amount of water that it, that it takes. And that's because we insist on, on eating, eating beef. So we've, if we ate lower uh, on, on the food chain, then, then uh, that would help very much. Um, we're never going to be producers because the real producers are plants. But yes. we get to choose which plants and how many we put around us. So we can boost the productivity of the land that we control with proper plant choice and proper plant maintenance. Yeah. And also our own waste distribution is, I, th I see that as one of the things we can manage as well. Um, not only our bodily waste management, but the impact we're having with our microplastics and things like that. So we're not, um, we're, the only thing we're producing a lot of the time is damage. Unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, yeah. You know, it's it's hard because each one of us sees a very small part of the planet each day, yeah. And it's very difficult for us to imagine that times seven point nine billion. Uh, so we look, you know, we use our plastic bags and we eat our our steak, and you know, it doesn't seem that bad for us as an individual. But when you multiply that, that's what's yeah. hard for us to envision, and and uh, and that's where the problem lies. Yeah, and to get a bit morbid, for all of the consuming we do throughout our lives, um, once we end up in the ground, it's, we're contributing very little <laughs> from, from a nutrient standpoint to that ecosystem. Yeah, especially the way we do it. We embalm ourselves to make sure nothing returns, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so where, where to next for you in your mission in um, within publication, research, what book's next? Well, I, I get, uh, email is my nemesis. You know, I, I get emails all day long and most of them are questions and a lot of them are repeated questions uh, and I could ignore them, but the, you know, the public is interested in, in learning how to do this stuff. So yeah. I, I'm really seriously considering a book where I answer these questions. You know, I say, here are yeah. the major questions on different topics. Uh, and and just just say this this is this is this is the answer. Don't email yeah. me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> the next big piece of research, though, the the reason we discovered the you know the presence the 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 best difference between keystone plants and and the rest was that we ranked their ability to support caterpillars across the every county in the country. Yeah. And that was based on, on the literature of the last hundred years. It was a big job. We've done it for North America, but it was a, it turned out to be a really powerful tool. I want to do that for all the countries in the world where the literature exists. It's going to be tough in, in parts of South America and, and Africa, but certainly through, through Europe, Australia, you've got great records of what eats what. And I can say, here's a list. These are the best plans that you should be putting in different parts of, of where you live. And then nobody has an excuse. They don't have to. I mean, Portugal, most of Portugal forests is eucalyptus. Mm. And they can say, well, oh, we didn't know this wasn't a forest. You know, <laughs> well, now, yeah. you know, here's, here's a list telling you what eucalyptus is supporting in Portugal, which is nothing. Yeah. So that's yeah. a that's a big piece of ignorance that I'd like to solve before I retire. Apologies on behalf of Australia for the rest of the world with eucalyptus <laughs> because it's pointless. Um, I, I, and the audiobook has the the back chapter of the q a which i really love about your book as well um, one question that stood out to me was someone asking you know if one invasive species in a whole ecosystem could it be really that bad for it and to which your response was something along the lines of 
well, if you've only got one tumor in your body, is that bad for it? <laughs> That's right. These species are tumors. They grow all the time. It doesn't stay one. Yeah. Uh, and that insidious nature of, of, of an invasive species. Yeah. And it's not a this... third of the vegetation in our natural areas is from China right now. Wow. Because they've escaped our gardens and, and, and they continue to spread, you know, another 10 yeah. years, there'll be a, a quarter or, or a, what, a half, who knows what. Yeah. It's um a really, it's like in my reticular activation system to see invasive species now. I think my wife is tired of me driving along the road and pointing something <laughs> out. I was yeah. like, this, oh, Singapore. We went to actually look at a property to buy and it was half covered in Singapore daisy. And I was like, yeah. no way. Beautiful property. Oh, but that gives you a goal. You can say, I'm going to fix this property. Yeah. But yeah, <laughs> that's, that's one way to look at it. But then I just thought I have no family time. I would spend my life <laughs> doing this that's Singapore true. daisy. It was like through a valley. There was so much of it. And I'm just like, mm -hmm. that's daunting. Um, so yeah. And, and to extend on that point, like one in one, I like how you say the one plant, the one invasive species isn't the problem. It's the growth of that species and the existing ecosystem that can't keep up with that rate of evolution to be competitive anymore. Mm -hmm. When you look at some of the major uh, invasive species we have like kudzu, you know, I, I, I think it covers 20 million acres. It's measured in millions. Privet, you know, millions more acres, bush honeysuckle, millions more acres covered yep. in these plants. That's only three species, but they're covering, you know, <laughs> half the United States. So yeah. Um, and um the cause gym. of a lot of the California fires, is my understanding, is was it creek grass or cheat cheat grass. Cheat grass. Cheat grass brought in uh, for cattle. Hmm. Uh, and and it you know it's nice and green in the spring but it but then it senesces and, and turns into tinder through most hmm. of the season and these forests these fires start outside of the fire the forest and then they run in through cheat grass right into the fire and the smallest thing can set it off a lightning strike you know somebody's cigarette and the whole west you know hundred, hundreds of millions of acres are covered with cheat grass yeah and um where another disservice we do is right through reading your book is um, not letting the natural burn off process happen within these huge big forest areas. Hence they burn, not just do a little grass fire under that understory and burn the grasses off. You were mentioning how it jumps to the canopy then. Yeah. So obviously um, two years ago, we suffered from some of the worst bushfires in recent memory in New South Wales. So interesting point yeah. well then you then you know what it's like but um yeah we've had a hundred years of fire suppression so yeah. all during that time fuel has built up yeah so when you get a fire it's a huge fire and it's not a ground fire it jumps to the canopy kills the trees and and uh, that's devastating to that particular ecosystem and most of our fires particularly in the west now are canopy fires yeah and I saw that devastation firsthand. I like going down to those communities and trying to help. Um, and still, you can see the severity. You, uh, everyone sees is so many of the trees sprouting new growth and saying, look, it just bounces back. But that's in certain areas. There's some that the burning is so severe and so hot, there's nothing growing back still. Years later, it's just a field of toothpicks. Yeah. And where's that life going to happen now? Right. which is which is scary we read about the koalas uh, i don't know how many koalas you lost yeah it's big fire. time so um is there going to be an a, so you're thinking a q a book next i would love that <laughs> sign me up yeah i say that i haven't had a, a second to write any of it but but that's what i'm thinking at this point um and for our listeners i would love for you to like and share this podcast and we will run a competition and give away some of your books because I think it's just so integral. Um, and also where can people find out more about what you do and if they want to learn more about ecology and entomology? We have a, we have our website, homegrownnationalpark.org.org. Uh, and a uh, lot of information on that, that website about what I've done, I've done and, and uh, about the organization. 
you know, we have we have the the map. Get yourself on the map. Become part of Homegrown National Park and tell us how many uh, how much area you're going to plant in in natives. Um, so that's another thing we'd like to expand that to other countries. We could we could start in Australia. Absolutely, we'll we'll be doing we'll be planting that playground by playground. We'll we'll log it. We'll we'll get it international. Good, good. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for contributing so much for my learning and sure my listeners' um, interest has been sparked in this such an integral, integral topic and field of study. So from me personally, thank you for all the work you do. Thank you for an amazing book as well. Um, I read one, I'm on to the next two. Um, I'm excited, but thanks so much for joining us today. Well, thanks for the opportunity.